all my strength. Haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword. My darling from the power of the dog. His soul is going to be delivered. Physically, he will die and he will go to hell. But God will save his soul from suffering corruption. He will raise him from the dead. Verse 21, save me from the lion's mouth. That's Satan there. For thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns at the altar there. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation. Will I praise thee? So you can see what they did to Christ on the cross and how difficult it was. And so Hebrews 12, 13 says, this is the contradiction of sinners that was against Jesus, what he endured. And so the author of Hebrews says, look to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Look at what he endured as a man on the cross. You notice in verse 2, Hebrews 12, 2, it doesn't say looking unto the Lord or the Lord Jesus Christ. It says looking unto Jesus. It's specifically Jesus the man. That was his name as a man. He is never called that in the Old Testament. He's called Emmanuel, God with us. You don't get the name of Jesus or his name as a man until uh, given prophetically to uh, Mary and Joseph and Matthew. So looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, he is the one as a man who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself to the point of death. And now verse 4 then, he says, Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. In other words, when this is the time when they resist unto blood primarily is going to be the last half of the tribulation period because that's when the capital punishment or the death penalty is given by Satan's forces for not taking the mark of the beast or worshiping the image. So that's when they primarily have to resist unto blood, giving their physical lives for the faith, just like Jesus did. And so he says, when that happens, when you come to those councils and they say, deny Jesus as Christ or you're going to be beheaded, they can look unto Jesus and say, he had the same problem I did. And as a man, he endured it. And he said, go ahead and take my life because I have faith in the Father to deliver my soul from the sword. Physically, they'll kill me, but they can't destroy the soul. And so that's what the tribulation saints need to do. They'll say, go ahead and physically kill me. You can't destroy the soul. So then verse 5 now, Hebrews 12, 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Um, so what it's saying here is that in order for Israel, they're apostate. If they weren't apostate, then they would have been taken up in the rapture. You know, right now, Jews, there's no difference between Jew or Gentile. If you trust in the blood of Christ as atonement for your sins, you have eternal life. So once the rapture takes place, all those believers are raptured up. God starts Israel's program again. And so on the earth at the time, there are no believers because they were all raptured up. So it's just a world of unbelievers. And so what God does, though, in Romans eleven twenty six, 26, he says, after the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, after the body of Christ is resurrected, then he says, and so all Israel shall be saved. So God takes Israel, unbelieving Israel, and he brings them to a place where they are saved. And he does that through the refiner's fire of the tribulation period. And that refiner's fire is referred to here as the chastening of the Lord. And the Lord knows that if he brings them through tribulations and rebukes and reproaches, that the result is all the lost sheep of the house of Israel will be found. They will all, through those trials and tribulations, end up believing the gospel of the kingdom, enduring unto the end, and be saved. All the lost sheep. Now, you've got a lot of people who are physical Jews who will not believe, and they'll end up in the lake of fire. But all those who God knows who are Jews who are uh, just not believing at the time of the rapture, 
but they will believe through the tribulation period. He brings them through that, and that's that chastening period. And he says you have forgotten that exhortation. That exhortation is found in Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12. So let's go over there and see that. Um, so this is a quote. In other, in other words, you've got the Old Testament here. You've got the, uh, the scripture for you to follow. And he says, you've forgotten what Proverbs 3, 11 and 12 says. So Proverbs 3, verse 11. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. What's interesting about that is that if you look at today in Christianity, the book of Proverbs, by far the most quoted verses in Proverbs is Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Go back to verse 5 there, Proverbs 3, 5. If a Christian only knows two verses by memory in Proverbs, I can pretty much guarantee it's Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. It says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. And all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Now that's, you know, that's, we certainly should today, I'm not saying don't memorize those verses. We certainly today should trust in the Lord with all our heart, not lean unto our own understanding. And then he, through the Holy Spirit today, will teach us his words and direct us through the Holy Spirit. Um, so, I'm not discounting that, but what I'm saying is that those verses that are so often quoted are in the context of the chastening of the tribulation period because you just go down another five verses and you see the chastening of the Lord and the author of Hebrews in Hebrews 12 verses 5 and 6 relates that chastening of Proverbs 3, 11 and 12 to the tribulation period. Um, and so he is the one I mean, really, those verses, trusting in the Lord, is really meant for the tribulation saints because they're the ones that have to go through chastening. Now, I put at the very end of your outline because people always want, since we're on the topic of chastening, they always wonder, well, does the Lord chasten us today? Uh, for the most part, the answer to that is no because what people think of chastening is they think, well, I did something that I shouldn't have done, I sinned, and so God is punishing me for that sin. That's what most people think of when the Lord's chasing you. I went through something, well, God's teaching me something through this trial that I'm going through. That's how they, so if you look at it in that sense, the answer is no. And the reason for that is because we are considered, in Galatians 4, it says we are adult sons. We are heirs. We've already joined heirs with Christ. Romans 8 says we are joint heirs with Christ. And Galatians 4 says we are heirs uh, already having received the promise, are already having received the atonement, justification, eternal life. Those we've already received and we're already seated with Christ in heavenly places. We're already blessed with spiritual blessings there. Israel is considered children. They're not sons yet. They're not adopted as sons. They don't receive the promises. They don't receive eternal life until Jesus brings in the kingdom. And so they're treated more like children. So the rebuke here, you know, in verse 12, Proverbs 3, 12, For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father of the son in whom he delighteth. If you have... If you're a father and then you have a son, well, you end up spanking him or hit, you know, um, correcting him physically as he is a child. When he turns 30 years old and does something and lands himself in jail, you may still try to chasten him, but you're not going to bend him over your knee and give him a spanking. That won't work. As an adult, it won't work. So, um, there is a chastening of the Lord for us today in the dispensation of grace. It's only mentioned once in Scripture, um, in Paul's epistles, I should say, chastening for us today. And that's over in 1 Corinthians 11. But it's not the chastening of, I don't want you to get the idea that, you know, oh, God's punishing me for some secret sin I did. Or God is trying to 
uh, you know, bring me through this trial so that I will grow in Him. Really, everything God does today is He treats you like an adult. So He's not going to spank you like you would a child. But if you have not walked in the Spirit and you're fulfilling the lust of the flesh, just like that 30-year-old who was in prison, the father may do something to try to correct him in, in that respect, but not physically spanking him. So too the Lord does that for us today. And according to 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 32, he does it through others. He chastens us through others. First Corinthians 11:31, Paul says, "For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged." So in other words, if we read God's word, believe it, allow the Holy Spirit to teach it to us, then what we'll do is we'll compare our behavior to the doctrine found in Paul's epistles, and we'll say, "Oh, well, I'm not being kind, tender-hearted, forgiving," as Ephesians 4:32 says. So I need to allow the Holy Spirit to work through me. So I would judge myself as not kind, and then I would allow the Holy Spirit to correct that behavior. So if I judge myself, then I'm not going to be judged by others, because others will say, hey, there's somebody Christ-like. But verse 32, it says, but when we are judged, in other words, we don't allow God's Word to correct us. It says, but when we are judged... We are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Now, we've already received our salvation, so it's not talking about that. But what it's talking about being condemned with the world is that if we're carnal Christians, we behave just like the world behaves, and then we go out and try to share the gospel with somebody or act like we're a Christian, the world isn't going to listen to us. Our message is going to be condemned, or we ourselves are going to be judged by the world as not any better than anybody else. And so when that happens then, we see that no one listens to us when we give God's word. Uh, no one believes us. They think we're just like everybody else. And so the way the Lord chastens us is we're judged by non-believers. Because they'll say, well, why should I listen to you? Why should I go to your church? Why should I believe your Bible when... You've got the same problems I do. But if I have allowed God's Word to judge me and allow the Holy Spirit to correct those problems, then there is no chastening of the Lord through others. So that's why the very bottom of your outline I wrote that we are chastened of the Lord in the dispensation of grace when others observe our unchristlike behavior. And I wrote a side note. It's... Um, this may be a fulfillment of 2 Samuel 7, 14. Um, I'll let you read that on your own and decide what you think. Basically, 2 Samuel 7 is the Davidic covenant, and God says to him that his son, if he commits iniquity, that he will chasten him with the rods and the stripes of men. Well, his son, the one who fulfills the Davidic covenant, is really the Lord Jesus Christ, being the son of David, he never sins. So you think, well, God knows that Jesus Christ would never sin, so why does he mention if he commit iniquity, then I would, I would chasten him with the rods and stripes of men. In fact, I'll read that to you so I won't misquote it. 2 Samuel 7.14 I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. Well, obviously, Jesus Christ never committed a sin. And we're studying Hebrews. We found that in Hebrews. He was tempted at all points, yet without sin. So he never commits a sin, but yet God says this is a, a possibility. You know, if he commit iniquity. Well, it's not really a possibility, for Jesus Christ because if he did commit a sin then he's not really the son of God and he didn't bring redemption even if he just committed one sin so why is that there if he commit iniquity I will chasten him with the rod of men well we today are the church the body of Christ so we are Christ in the sense that we represent him 
And we're told in 1 Corinthians 11.32 that we are chastened of the Lord when others, unbelievers, judge us. And so if God promises that He will chasten His Son, and we are sons of God, having received the promise, join heirs with Christ, where lives are hid with Christ in God. So, the chastening with the rod of men would be possibly the unbelievers showing that you're not Christ-like, and that's considered chastening of the Lord, and that's, of course, us committing iniquity. So, it, it may be the committing of iniquity there in 2 Samuel 7.14, of course, Jesus Christ didn't do it, but us as the body of Christ, and maybe that's us. So, yeah, that's a tangent. That's something to think about. Okay, back into Hebrews chapter 12. So verses 5 and 6, he warns them about the chastening of the Lord. That's a quote from Proverbs 3. They need to trust the Lord so that they're not chastened. And then in verse 7, then, he goes on. And he really defines, there's a, the chastening of the Lord in the tribulation period is the way that he separates the wheat from the chaff, or the sheep from the goats. It's who are the people who are really trusting in the Lord and who aren't. I can say, oh sure, I trust in the Lord, I believe the gospel of the kingdom. But that's easy for me to say, sitting here in this chair. But if... The, the governmental power over the entire world has a guillotine sitting over there and says, deny Christ or I'm chopping your head off right now. That really shows if I'm trusting in the Lord or not. Because then, the only way I'm going to allow you to chop my head off is if I really trust that God is going to bring me into His kingdom that he will give me eternal life there. That, you know, death is the ultimate decider there. You find out who's lying and who's telling the truth uh, when, it, when your life is at stake there. And so that's what he's talking about here in verses 7 and 8. He says, verse 7, Hebrews 12, 7, If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers then are ye bastards and not sons. His chastening here isn't spanking you on the bottom. His chastening is physical death in that last half of the tribulation period. That's when you consider your spiritual life that, and your spirit lives forever. Um, you know, just like a, a father spanks the child on the bottom. Well, he's hurting the child, but the father knows you know, that's gonna, the sting will go away pretty quickly. The redness will go away. There's no permanent injury in the child. It's just to teach him, you know, I, I do this to you. I spank you because that will go away. Because if you don't learn the lesson, then you're going to end up, you know, in jail for your entire life. Or you're going to end up in a situation that's going to be very bad. It's going to last, you know, for years, whatever it is, you know, you you get drunk and you deal with alcoholism, or you get into drugs, you deal with that, or you, you get into promiscuity, or whatever it is. And the consequences are going to be far more than just a little redness and a little tingling. So you give you a little bit of the punishment to show you if you don't obey, you're going to have much worse. And that's what, in the scope of eternity, when you look at your spirit, your spirit and your soul live forever. You're either going to suffer forever in a lake of fire and be tormented night and day, no rest whatsoever for all eternity, or you're going to be in God's kingdom for all eternity. So God looks at it and says, I want you to be in the kingdom. And so he's willing to give you a little spank on the bottom, which equates to physical death. And you say, physical death, that sounds harsh. Not in the scope of eternity. That's just a little sting that will go away and when the resurrection happens, and at the end of the tribulation period, they receive their new bodies, uh, no blemishes, no curse of sin, and they live for all eternity in that. So the chastening there uh, could end up in as much as physical death. And so those who are partakers of that, Hebrews 12, 8, um, if they are partakers, then they're sons. But if they're not, 
they're considered bastards. Bastards meaning um, you're posing as a son. You're not really a son. You just look like one. Uh, that's what a bastard is. So, I wrote on your outline that the bastards are apostate Israel. Uh, the way we know that, they are born of the devil. Look over in John 8, because he's talking about sons, you know, sons of God. The ones who endure chastening are the sons. And so in John 8, he's talking to the Pharisees who appear to be saved and going into the kingdom because they are physical Jews. But Jesus says the ones who are saved are the spiritual Jews. They have to have faith. It's not just because I've been circumcised and I'm physically a Jew. You have to have that, but then you also have to have the faith. He says in John 8, notice in verse 37, he says, I know that ye are Abraham's seed. He says, I acknowledge you are a physical Jew. But then he says, but ye seek to kill me. So if you seek to kill me, you're not a spiritual Jew. He says in verse 39, They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Now they're talking spiritually. And Jesus saith unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Okay, you're not Abraham's child. Physically, yes. Spiritually, no. Here's who you, who, who you are spiritually, verse 44. Ye are of your father the devil and the lust of your father ye will do. So he equates apostate Israel, those religious people, who say, look at me, I'm going to be in the kingdom. Abraham is my father. And he says, you are trying to squash the truth. Abraham embraced the truth. Since you're not trusting in the Lord and lean on into your own understanding, you're really bastards. You're not, you appear to be God's sons. But because you lack the faith in God's plan, then you are not his sons. You are rather fa your father is not God. Your father is the devil. And then it's at the end of the tribulation period that he's going to separate the bastards from the sons. And if you go over to Matthew 13, the language given in this parable is the wheat versus the tares. The wheat are the ones who are gathered into his barn. But then the tares are the ones that are burned. Um, and so gathered in the barn means going into the kingdom for all eternity. Being burned is equated with um, eternity in the lake of fire. Verse 40, Matthew 13, verse 40. As therefore the tares are gathered and burnt in the fire. So that's lake of fire. It says, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth His angels, and they shall gather out of His kingdom all things that offense, that's all unbelievers, and them which do iniquity. Verse 42, And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. That's the lake of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. But then you've got the wheat, verse 43, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun, in the kingdom of their father. They're not going to be burned. They're not going to be thrown in the lake of fire. They're going to be shining forth as a sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So they're actually going to enter the kingdom. So I wrote in your outline that at the end of the tribulation period, God separates sons from bastards, and that's what he does here. Wheat from the tares. Uh, you notice verse 40 said, so shall it be in the end of this world. God's going to allow... Satan to rule through the Antichrist through the entire tribulation period and then he waits until the end and that's when you have the angels he says okay angels it's time go gather out the tares the unbelievers get them out of here because I've got to have a holy kingdom and those who don't have faith in God are unholy so we got to get rid of those so we get rid of them throw them into a furnace of fire but the righteous the believers they remain on the earth and they go into the kingdom for all eternity. Okay, so now going back to Hebrews chapter 12. So verse 7 and 8, you saw the difference between the sons and the bastards. And those who go through the chastisement of God, meaning they're willing to die physically, or they run for their lives, they do not take the mark of the beast, 
they are hungry, they do not worship the image of the beast, they do not receive riches from aligning themselves with apostate Israel, those are the sons. They've endured the chastisement of this world. Verse 9, Hebrews 12, 9. I'm sorry, we're in, yeah, verse 9. Furthermore, so in addition to what we just learned here, furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? So there's that contrast, and we talked about that, how with God, the chastising that God does, may it may include physical death. They may have to go before the Antichrist, and they don't take the mark of the beast, or they don't worship the image, the Antichrist physically beheads them, chops off their head, they're dead physically. That's okay, because God is the father of spirits. So he says, when we had fathers of our flesh, they spanked us on the bottom, and it hurt our flesh, but we endured it, we allowed them to correct us, we gave them reverence, because they are our fathers, they are of us, above us. Honor thy father and thy mother. So we allowed that to happen. But the thing is, those fathers of our flesh, they don't last for all eternity. Your father, chances are, your father will die before you do. Uh, maybe you live, maybe your father lives to be a hundred something. Well, they're going to die before you reach 80, probably. You probably won't live, probably, there's very few people over 80 who have a father left. Very few. Um, you're going to, at most, have a father for 80 years, a father of the flesh, because they'll physically die. God, though, being a father of spirits, and your spirit lasts forever, he'll be your father, if you're his son, for all eternity. And so, correcting you with physical death is no big deal, because when physical death happens, he's still your father. So, if he's the father of spirit, if you allow a father of your flesh who will only be your father at most for 80 years and you give him reverence, how much more should you give reverence to God who's going to be your father for all eternity? And if he corrects you with physical death, so be it. Because he'll raise you from the dead. He doesn't cease to be your father at that point. John 4, 24. Talking about him being the father of spirits, John 4, 24. 